Tonight, the Queen preempts a royal family feud. Harry, Meghan, and Archie are coming to Canada. The Queen is so determined to try and find some kind of compromise. Lots of questions for Canadians about security, the cost, and where the family will live. We've got some answers. It's official. The Conservative race to replace Andrew Scheer begins. Congratulations to those men. After a blockbuster year for women film directors, why Oscar shrugged again. And nearly a week after the downing of Flight 752, grief makes room for anger. In Canada... Shame on you! Shame on you! And in Iran. The emotion, the investigation, the politics. This is The National. Today, a rebellious prince was summoned by a duty-bound queen, and something had to give. A royal summit was called to avert a crisis. Now, controversy has been boiling over in the days since Harry and Meghan made a historic announcement on Instagram, no less, that they intend to step back as senior royals to build an independent life. Today, the queen confirmed their intention to live at least part-time in Canada. Now, people here will want to know what that might cost, and we'll look into that. We'll also examine how the royals might use this as an opportunity to evolve. But first, the CBC's Renee Filipponi tells us about this monumental change in the royal script, why it's happening now, and how it came to be. That fairy tale day, just 20 months ago, when the world tuned in for Harry and Meghan's wedding, now seems like a distant memory. Today, the media focused on the Queen's Sandringham estate as she summoned Princes Charles, William and Harry to discuss the couple's now uncertain future as royals. Following the meeting, she issued a statement calling the talks very constructive, saying the royal family is entirely supportive of Harry and Meghan's desire to create a new life as a young family, though they would have preferred them to remain full-time working members. The Queen is so determined to try and find some kind of compromise that keeps Harry within the fold. Because if Harry was to turn us back on royal duties entirely, I think that would be devastating for the Queen, for the family. But there are crucial details to work out. What will their role be? Can they keep their Royal Highness's title? And how will they support themselves financially? There are going to be so many lucrative offers for them going forwards. The most toxic thing for the royal family is being seen to cash in on your royal status. It's been five days since the Duke and Duchess of Sussex made the announcement, and the story continues to dominate the headlines. Princes Harry and William are raising concerns about how the media is covering it. A media report today suggested William bullied the couple out of the family. The brothers deny it, and in a rare joint statement, called the report offensive and potentially harmful. I absolutely hate the fact that this is being called Megxit. This UK journalist says Meghan seems to be taking the fall and she isn't surprised. Meghan has been vilified in, by the press for months and months and months now. There's been coverage against her that's been, you know, sexist, racist, all sorts of things, and I just don't find it shocking that her and Harry have finally decided this is it. From the decision to leave to how the couple went about it, people are looking for someone to blame as the couple's decision to seek privacy has only pushed them further into the spotlight. Okay, so Renee, let's talk a bit more about the Queen's message today. It had a distinctly different tone from when the news first broke. That's right, Andrew. Last week, the palace a statement was very short, two sentences saying it was a complicated issue that would take some time to work through. Today, from an institution known for its formality, a much, a much more personal tone from the Queen. She calls the Duke her grandson and refers to the couple by their first name, not their title. This was a statement about family. In fact, she used the word eight times at a time when she's really trying to keep her family together and preserve their place in history. Andrew? Okay, the CBC's Renee Filipponi at Buckingham Palace tonight. So now that Prince Harry and Meghan's move here is a go, how are Canadians feeling? And are they going to be stuck paying the security bills? The CBC's Catherine Cullen has that side of the story. At the Royal Oak Pub, the royal response is just so very Canadian. I mean, uh, if they want to come, they're more than welcome. The New York Times reports Harry and Meghan have left many Canadians giddy. I think they should live their lives however they want. I think that's a very reasonable proposition, actually. 
The British Mirror says the possibility of paying for the family's security has Canadians furious. That's frustrating. That's definitely frustrating. I didn't tell them to move here. <laughs> but we did find one Canadian who sounds pretty pumped. We're both kind of giddy about it. The BC Premier is talking about himself and the Prime Minister, whom he spoke with today. Canada's a cool place to be. We all are pretty happy about that uh, as Canadians. Uh, people want to come here in large numbers. Uh, now we have some, uh, some Brexit uh, examples uh, that, that are coming our way. I think that's good news. He even suggested he could find Harry a job. But this constitutional expert wants Canadians to know there are some jobs the Prince won't be getting. Prince Harry will not be King of Canada. Prince Harry will not be Governor General. Prince Harry uh, will perhaps have a celebrity profile. He will perhaps help Canadian charities raise money. He may engage in patronage activities and selling his brand. But we are not creating a Canadian royal family. As for Canadian taxpayers getting stuck with those security bills, the Prime Minister's office won't comment. And the Finance Minister was distinctly less than giddy. No, we haven't spent any time thinking about this issue. Coming to Canada won't be an issue, however. A spokesperson for the Minister of Immigration says as royals, they don't need authorization to come here as visitors. But if the family wants to apply for permanent residency, they'll need to go through the same process as any commoner would. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. So if Harry, Meghan and Archie do move to Canada long term, what happens next? You can't just be a royal and then decide not to be. <laughs> There are a lot of questions about what this move means for the future of the monarchy and, of course, what it means for Canada. We'll dig into some of those a little later on the program. But first, we do want to turn to the very latest in a story that has gripped Canadians for nearly a week. For investigators, protesters, and above all, the families of the passengers, the fallout, fury, and the horror of the downing of Flight 752 is far from over. Tonight, we have full coverage. How the crash has shaken the Islamic Republic. How rage there is echoed here in Canada. A call for accountability that focuses not just on Iran's leadership, but on facts hidden in the wreckage. Two Canadian investigators are in Iran, heading to the crash site tomorrow. Another Canadian team will analyze the black box recordings. But while this was a tragedy for so many Canadians, it's an Iranian investigation. Ashley Burke has more on what that means. This is what Canada is eager to see, the wreckage where some of the big answers may lie. The world deserves to know how and why events unfolded as they did. They know who did it. Iran admitted to firing the missile that killed 176 people. But was it an accident, as Iran says? One question this team hopes to answer. Canada's role is evolving. It remains to be seen how far we're going to be able to go. It's not a lead role, but Iran is giving Canada more access than required under international rules. Access to inspect the wreckage firsthand and to the all-important black box. An encouraging level of openness from the country that shot down the plane. I'm optimistic that at least things are moving in that direction, but again, we'll, we'll have to see. Because clearly some of these questions are going to be very uncomfortable for the country. Uh, to answer. Questions about the chain of events leading up to the takeoff and the missile strike. Uh, aircraft were allowed to continue to take off both before and after uh, the uh, flight 752. Uh, it brings into question why was the airport, why was the airspace open? As investigators set out to connect the dots, the Prime Minister has connected the crash to the wider U.S.-Iranian conflict that made the skies so dangerous. I think if there were no uh, tensions, if there was no uh, escalation recently in the region, uh, those uh, Canadians would be right now home with their families. Those families are waiting for the answers, but right now investigators are just getting started, and the true level of cooperation they'll get from Iran is still unclear. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. There are signs that Iranian authorities are trying to contain the political damage by leaning on the families of victims there. An Iranian activist posted this video purportedly showing a mother screaming for help. She was reportedly told by Iranian intelligence to be silent or risk losing access to her son's remains. Yeah. 
Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs retweeted the video stating the allegations are disturbing and that we will look into them. As Paul Hunter shows us, the streets in Iran are now sites of spontaneous rage and increasingly a crackdown. On the streets of Tehran, scenes of fury. And from government authorities trying to contain the still growing crowds, a fierce reply. Amid the tear gas and amid the sound of gunfire, a woman shouts, my foot, my foot. Says someone else, she's been hit. Through it all, the protests continue, with Iranians angry not only that their government shot down that plane, but it then lied to its own people about it. The demonstrations now spreading beyond the capital, and word some now chant death to the supreme leader. Meanwhile, a day after Donald Trump warned the Iranian regime, do not kill your protesters, the world is watching today Iran's response. Crocodile tears from Trump for the Iranian people, said a government spokesman, underlining for Iranians it's Trump who's behind the crippling economic sanctions and it's Trump who 10 days ago targeted and killed top Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. Then again, among the images from those protests, this one, of demonstrators burning a billboard of Soleimani. And now as well, prominent Iranians are backing the throngs. Wrote this Iranian film actress to her six million followers, we are not citizens, we never were, we are captives, millions of captives. This former news anchor also sent a message. Forgive me, she wrote, apologizing for lying to Iranians on state TV for 13 years. And this film director spoke out, calling for more protests, tellingly she was arrested. And on it goes. For countless Iranians, all of it leads to the only question that matters now. Where does this go next? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Peter Armstrong shows us how here in Canada, too, the sentiment has shifted from grief-stricken reaction to angry calls for action. You can almost feel the moment at rallies and vigils across the country. It's a very, very sad day for every single person here. In city after city, rally after rally, shock turning to grief and finally to anger. Shame on you! Shame on you! Family members remembering their lost loved ones. Mom, remember, you're my last patient. As the hours since the crash turn into days, those questions become demands. And we need to know why. Why did this happen to them? That anger isn't limited to the friends and families. Even the prime minister said he's furious over the downing of Ukraine Flight 752. We will not rest until there is justice and accountability. Canada has been unusually frank in its anger, whether it's cartoons like this, or tweets from one of the country's biggest companies. Michael McCain, CEO of Maple Leaf Foods, issued a series of exceedingly rare, sharply critical tweets over the weekend. I'm very angry, he wrote, saying a Maple Leaf Foods colleague lost his family in the attack. Canadians needlessly lost their lives in the crossfire. Payman Parseon has traveled the road from grief to anger, too. Use that anger for, for, for appropriate methods, like channeling it towards making the right changes. Uh, making changes like, for example, banning airlines from allowing planes to take off in conflict zones. Shut down the plane. Meantime, it's not just emotions that are changing. All those vigils mourning the loss becoming protests, calling for action and for justice. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Supporting victims' families is a challenge, given the lack of a Canadian footprint on the ground in Tehran. But that is changing rapidly. Three consular officials are in Tehran, six more on the way. A full team expected in place by the end of the week. Officials are also fanning out to major cities across Canada to counsel families. Ellen Morrow shows us one Canadian who knows the difficult road they face. It's just heart-wrenching because I honest to God know exactly how they feel and there's nothing that anybody can say or do that's going to make it any better.
Lexi Milana knows the agony all too well. Like the year before he died. Her brother, Andre Angel, the only Canadian victim of MH17, the plane shot down by a missile over eastern Ukraine in 2014. And I miss him every day, right? And then sometimes you go through a few days where you're not crying and you're not, you know, a complete mess. And then you feel guilty for it, right? It's not like we're forgetting. It's just this is life. But learning to live with her brother's loss was grueling. So were the logistics after his death. Police came to take DNA samples. The family struggled to get a proper death certificate. And to this day, no accountability. I used to be angry about it. But at the end of the day, it still doesn't change anything. It doesn't bring any of those people back. Her family's only recourse, a financial settlement from Malaysia Airlines. Essentially, they asked you to put a dollar amount on what your loved one's life was worth. I'm never going to have nieces and nephews. My brother was not at my wedding. He never got to meet my husband. How do you put a value on that? That arduous journey, one so many more Canadians are now just beginning. My heart breaks that so many other families have to deal with what we dealt with because I would have never wished this on my worst enemy, not to anybody. That ended up being our last picture together. Milana, a veteran of grief, has these hard-earned words for the newly mourning. You have to learn to live with it, right? As, as painful as that may be, you just you have to live, right? Because that's the best way to honor them. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. One last note on the story tonight. The Canadian businessman behind Paramount Fine Foods has launched the Canada Strong campaign to help victims' families. He hopes to raise $1.5 million to cover their expenses. Now to a story about the fight for political power in this country. The contest to become the new federal conservative leader is now officially on. And as Hannah Thibodeau tells us, the party is running this race like an election campaign. Okay, I have the envelope. To be on the ballot this time, a candidate will need $300,000 and 3,000 signatures from party members. Andrew Scheer. It's a big increase from the 2017 leadership race that elected Andrew Scheer. Then it was $100,000 and 300 signatures. So we want to make sure that uh, contenders feel the pressures of an election, um, the deadlines that are required, the thresholds that are required. And uh, we feel this is a good way to, to test those, uh, those aspiring candidates. The last race with 14 candidates dragged on for nearly a year and a half. This speedier process will take less than six months. You're in a minority government where, uh, you know, I don't personally think that the government will fall anytime soon, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an increased possibility for the Conservatives. They have to be ready. They've got to make sure that they can fundraise with that new leader and be ready to go for the next election. I'm ready to lead. Marilyn Gladue is the first woman and caucus member to announce. I can bring the party together, I can bring a winning strategy, and that's what we need. But all eyes are on people who haven't confirmed. Many are waiting to see what former interim leader Ronna Ambrose decides. Former cabinet minister Peter McKay is expected to jump in. Former Quebec premier and progressive conservative party leader Jean Charest is weighing his support in a party he left more than 20 years ago. And prominent caucus members Pierre Polyev and Aaron O'Toole are in, but haven't officially announced. They and others have until the end of February to decide. The new leader will be announced at a convention in Toronto on June 27th. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. More news ahead on The National, including after a record-breaking year for women directors. Congratulations to those men. They're shut out of the Oscar nods again. More on our top story. What do Canadians think about Harry, Meghan and Archie's big move? And a high-flying birthday. Former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien gets airborne for his 86th. We're back in two. We did it! The world's first dragon Viking utopia. Oscar nominations are out, and five Canadians made the cut. Among them, Quebec writer-director Dean De Blois for his animated feature, How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. And Montreal-based director Miriam Dubois is up for best live-action short for her film Brotherhood. We just went wild when the news came out. We just started screaming and just had a great moment. 
But just a few years after the Oscars So White scandal, only one actor of color was nominated. I made a diss for all my own, so don't you tell me what I can't do. That's Cynthia Erivo's portrayal of Harriet Tubman. But other award-winning performances were passed over, like Aquafina in The Farewell, Jennifer Lopez in Hustlers, and Lupita Nyong'o in Us. Now, people of color were nominated in non-performance categories, including Best Director. Bong Joon-ho got the nod for his South Korean conman comedy, Parasite. But if you look at the four other names on that list, you'll notice there's not a single woman. And as Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains, it's not as if there weren't any to choose. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? Different in style and storyline. All the shooting. <laughs> the top Oscar contenders still have something in common. Most of them are stories about men directed by men. The best director category was once again without female contenders. Congratulations to those men. Most notable absence, the director of the critically acclaimed Little Women, Greta Gerwig. It did get six nominations, including Best Picture, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actress. Uh, I, who chose these people? Who, who cast this movie? Um, it was Greta Gerwig. Who made it? Uh, so it was a pretty shocking thing. Lorraine Scafaria, the director of Hustlers, the film that earned $150 million with an all-star cast led by Jennifer Lopez. Then there was Lulu Wang's The Farewell, a Chinese-American family drama that charmed the critics. First they said that there were not enough women. Then they said your stories are not quality enough. Then they say your movies don't make enough money. Well, all those things have been fulfilled. Indeed, more than 10% of the year's top 100 grossing films were directed by women. But with a record 63 female nominees overall, the Academy might say the women are being rewarded. Four out of five documentaries nominated, for example, were directed or co-directed by women. But when it comes to Best Director, who casts the votes? It's the director's branch of the Academy that nominates Best Director. And it's just a very male division still. They're prone to liking Martin Scorsese for The Irishman, Todd Phillips for Joker. Says the Academy aims for a more inclusive membership, it might want to take a closer look at that branch. No one makes their own way, least of all a woman. Deanna Sumanag Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. All right, let's take a look at some other stories making headlines across Canada tonight. BC is sure getting hit hard by an Arctic blast. At least, at least half a dozen school districts canceled classes and thousands of people were in the dark because of the cold, snowy conditions. That weather wreaked havoc on the roads, leading to long delays and lots of collisions on major highways. This is the first of several storm systems expected in the province this week. And that same system is gripping much of Western Canada tonight. Extreme cold warnings are in place from Yukon through northern BC, Alberta, and much of Saskatchewan. The wind chill could bring temperatures as low as minus 40 in some parts of Alberta. Emergency warming shelters have been set up in several cities across the region. At this point, their negotiating team has no authority to bargain an agreement. And this leaves teachers with nowhere else to go but the picket line. And Ontario's English Catholic school teachers have announced a one-day strike for a week tomorrow. As talks for the province appear to have stalled, public elementary teachers stepped up their Work to Rule campaign today, and plans are in place for rotating strikes starting next week. Meanwhile, public high school teachers are set to stage the latest in a series of rotating strikes this Wednesday. And more news ahead on The National, including the state of calamity declared in the Philippines. Thousands are out of their homes as a volcano continues to threaten the area. But first... I didn't remove healthy breasts to not get breast cancer, only to have textured implants put in that are known to cause a rare type of another cancer. It was supposed to be a solution for women at risk of breast cancer. A health story you will not want to miss. Next. Welcome back. In health news tonight, CBC News has learned that more women with textured breast implants have been diagnosed with a rare type of cancer than previously thought. The Kadopia explains why the risk may have been underestimated. 
Okay, so my family tree. It's a troubled family tree rooted in the BRCA2 gene mutation. Ovarian cancer. Karen Malkin Lazarovitz carries the gene. It left her with one of the hardest decisions in her life seven years ago. I removed my healthy breasts because of my high risk of breast cancer. A surgeon rebuilt her breasts using biocell textured implants, but after Health Canada suspended their sale in May, Malkin Lazarovitz had hers out. I didn't remove healthy breasts to not get breast cancer, only to have textured implants put in that are known to cause a rare type of another cancer. That other cancer is a type of lymphoma called BIA-ALCL, treatable if caught in time. Right now, the risk of developing it is estimated at 1 in 3,500. Last May, Health Canada said 54 breast implant patients were either confirmed or suspected of having the cancer. Now, Health Canada tells us the number is almost double, 106, including two women who died. This cosmetic surgeon says the new numbers may be higher due to duplication, yet they're still hard to ignore. I think the numbers that we're getting from Health Canada are really scary because, not just from Health Canada, but even worldwide, because they're changing so quickly. The numbers fluctuate because there's no centralized system to track confirmed cases or the thousands of implanted patients. It's not just a Canadian problem. We could have the very first speaker. At the first world conference on BIA ALCL, experts refer to the cancer as emerging because it may not be so rare. And I tell them that the risk of developing BILCL is likely higher with longer age of implants. So this U.S. surgeon checked up on every patient he used textured implants on and found this cancer was 10 times more prevalent than current estimates. So what's been the experience of the 3,546 patients, 10 now have BILCL? Terry McGregor was the only Canadian patient at the conference. She was diagnosed with BIA-ALCL five years ago and warns against downplaying the risk. We have women in Canada presenting symptoms to their physician and the physician is telling them that they don't have cancer and they should stop worrying and that they should get on with their lives because of the word rare. Health Canada does not recommend removing textured implants preemptively because that also has risks and there's still no guarantee doing so will prevent the onset of this cancer. Vicadopia, CBC News, Toronto. Canadians have the next two weeks to help shape the future of medically assisted dying legislation. The federal government launched public consultations today. Right now, a person's death must be reasonably foreseeable. But last year, a Quebec court ruled that's too restrictive. So Canadians are being asked to consider questions like whether a patient can make an advanced request to die before that patient loses the ability to give competent consent. An online questionnaire is available on the Department of Justice website. More news next on The National, including some stories from around the world. And we get answers to common questions about Harry, Meghan, and Archie. If and when they move here, where would they live? How would they make money? And what does it mean for Canada and the royal family? That's next. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some stories making news around the world tonight. So that is volcanic lightning seen for the second day in the Philippines. Seismologists are warning an explosive volcanic eruption could come at any time. Schools and businesses in nearby Manila closed with authorities warning an eruption could actually trigger a tsunami. This was an act of terrorism. The evidence shows that the shooter was motivated by jihadist ideology. The United States is sending home 21 Saudi military students following an investigation into last month's Florida mass shooting that killed three U.S. sailors and injured eight others. The Saudi cadets aren't being accused of aiding the 21-year-old Saudi Air Force lieutenant responsible, but officials say they were found to have jihadist material and indecent images of children in their possession. Today, I'm suspending my campaign for president with the same spirit with which it began. And he's out. Cory Booker is dropping out of the race for Democratic presidential nomination. The New Jersey senator made the announcement this morning on social media. Booker was struggling to raise money, was sliding in the polls, and had failed to qualify for tomorrow's Democratic debate in Iowa. Now let's go deeper on our top story. The royal crisis that led to today's family summit and an extraordinary statement from the Queen. 
my family, my family and I. I can't recall a statement in which she clearly expresses her feelings so much. Feelings like disappointment that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex intend to step back as senior royals and regret that the bombshell news was dropped last week without warning. You can't just be a royal and then decide not to be. <laughs> the couple's plans have stirred skepticism, even blame from a press that has at times fixated on Meghan Markle's biracial background. This from last fall's ITV documentary. I never thought that this would be easy but I thought it would be fair. The British Empire faces an extraordinary crisis. Now, the monarchy has seen a storm like this before. In the 1930s, King Edward VIII fell in love with an American, even gave up the throne for her. But the monarchy was on firmer ground then. These are different times. And the question today, what does it all mean for the royal family's future? Okay, now Richard Fitzwilliams is a royal commentator with deep insight into the, the nuts and bolts of British society. Richard, you're also accustomed to decoding royal language and intention, so tell us, what did you read into the Queen's statement that the rest of us might have missed? Well, I, I'm not sure that a very large number of people missed what the Queen meant simply because there has been the most extraordinary media circus worldwide. There's fascination about what was going to happen at the summit today. Uh, the Queen made it absolutely clear that she is only too pleased to back something that is unprecedented, Harry and Meghan stepping down from royal duties as senior royals, but continuing them in an independent way. I would say that um, it's been a hellish two months for the royal family with the Prince Andrew debacle, um, relatively recent, and this last week has been absolutely ghastly. But the hope is that this will provide, certainly for the future, perhaps a template that others may, who are unhappy with royal duties conventionally, may choose to use. I am curious to know, do, do you think that the Queen had, had any choice but to set Harry and Meghan free, in a way? Frankly, I don't think so, because uh, there would have been a backlash in possibly in the form of some form of kiss and tell interview. That is something that was the nuclear button. I mention it because it was on practically every front page of a newspaper today. Equally, she is fond of her grandson. She recognizes that he and Meghan have tremendous problems in adjusting to royal life and are pressurized and unhappy, as they made clear in the ITV documentary after their Southern African visit. So she compromised. So you, you, you talk about sort of creating a new model for, for royals going future. Is that ultimately good or bad for the royal family as an institution? Well, I think it's following uh, royals in Europe to some extent, just as uh, marrying non-royals did, and also the abolition of the male child taking precedence did. But of course, it depends on the individuals, and it will depend on how they handle it. And Harry and Meghan must be well aware that every single thing they do will be microscopically examined from now on, especially having, I have to say, mishandled the last week in an extraordinary way and putting the monarch under a lot of pressure. I think that we have a very, very interesting times ahead. I just hope they make the best of them and they have remarkable talents and that they can spread uh, what they're really good at as a charitable activism around the Commonwealth and elsewhere. Well, I suppose the, the media circus will continue then. Richard Fitzwilliams, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Now, as we said, this move by Harry and Meghan raises all sorts of questions about how a new arrangement with the monarchy would work. So now we turn to Omid Scobie. He covers the royals with a special emphasis on the younger members of the family. And he's got some answers for us. When Harry and Meghan say they want financial independence, they mean they no longer want to take from the sovereign grant, which is parts provided by the government and the UK taxpayer. Of course, that means that they do have to take their money from elsewhere. They'll be earning that money, but they'll also be looking for father, Prince Charles, to still provide some funding from the Duchy of Cornwall, which is his estate. 
Well, despite this big change to Harry and Meghan's working model, we'll still see them at Trooping the Colour, we'll still see them at all the big royal gatherings. We'll also see them supporting the Queen and doing work in her name, whether that's overseas tours, they're still coming, and of course engagements here in the UK and around the world and across the Commonwealth. So for them, the work does continue. This just allows them to take on other work that doesn't necessarily follow the agenda of the royal family. Well, one of the hardest things for Harry and Meghan has been basically trying to get jobs like normal people. It's not the done thing in the royal family. Sophie and Edward tried to do this in the late 90s and it ended in disaster. The Queen had to buy them out of their jobs. Well, Harry and Meghan still have Frogmore Cottage here in the UK as their base. That doesn't change. The UK is still very much home for them. But of course, Canada's now in the picture. We know they've stayed in Vancouver on Vancouver Island uh, in the past, and that will continue to be part of the picture temporarily. However, it's not known where else they'll live in Canada moving forward. Could there be a place in Toronto? Meghan loves it there. It'll certainly be high up on the list. So it's actually a huge bonus for the royal family to now have Harry and Meghan as ambassadors for the royal family living in Canada. We don't often see members of the royal family living in other Commonwealth countries. This in fact will help grow the brand of the firm moving forward and for Harry and Meghan it's a special place for them. There have never been senior members of the royal family who have stepped away from those duties and taken on their own jobs, funded themselves, but kept one foot in the House of Windsor to continue doing royal engagements. It's why it's taken so long to reach this point. We've yet to hear about how they'll be funded moving forwards. Of course, they still need protection officers. Will Canada be stepping in to help pay for that? How about Frogmore Cottage? It was taxpayer funded for the renovations. Will they be repaying some of that back to the sovereign grant? There are a lot of unanswered questions and they're ones that I'm keen to get answers to. But I think most of all, the thing that we should be celebrating at the moment is Harry and Meghan have actually found the happiness and the positive that they wanted in this deal. And hopefully their lives will be very very different moving forward. Now we want to give you the chance to weigh in on these potential new Canadians. You can head to our Instagram story, try out our virtual red chair and answer today's question. Meanwhile, Nick Purden set out today with his actual red chair to put that same question to folks on the street. Here's what you had to say. this at breakfast. Ugh. That's a hot potato in England right now. Oh my. Megan, Harry, Canada? Yes, please come. <laughs> they're bold, you know, they're 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 making a statement and and they're just so in love, which I love. Megan, Harry, Canada. Question mark. I don't really care. It doesn't make any difference to me if they come or not, to be honest. Megan, Harry, Canada? Absolutely. Absolutely. Come on over. They're one of us anyways. And they're blaming Megan, and they shouldn't blame Megan. She's giving him the courage to say, So if I was the queen, I'd be a little bit confused or curious as to why they, had, why they would want to leave the royal family. Uh, I feel like Meghan got a lot of uh, a lot of negative media attention. Harry's probably not going to become king, so he's getting out while he can. And uh, I appreciate them becoming financially dependent. I think it's good. If I could say something to Harry and Meghan, I would say, welcome to Canada. It would be great to have you here. Uh, I don't think the Canadian government should help them. They have enough help as it is. I think it's pretty much high time that somebody pulls away from the royal family, make it on their own. I think that's really a good, a good, a, a progressive move on their part. So I'm happy about that. What do I think about them? I think that it must be awful to have your life under constant scrutiny. Actually, I feel sorry for them in that way. And I think they should be able to live wherever they want to live. Oh, I'm done? If I could say anything to Meghan and Harry, um, I'd say, uh, just stay in Britain. Oh. <laughs>
If I could say something to Meghan and Harry, I would say, crack on. Crack on, you beautiful couple. <laughs> nice. Okay, so for your dose of everything royal, hey, you can subscribe to our newsletter, The Royal Fascinator. It lands in your inbox every other Friday. Sign up at cbc.ca slash royalfascinator. And more news next on The National, including a record-breaking fine in Major League Baseball for cheating. And even though it won the 2017 World Series, the team's leadership is out right after this. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, anti-government protests have erupted in Iran over the shooting down of Flight 752. We talk to a journalist on the ground. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. A century after baseball's infamous Black Sox scandal, a very modern kind of cheating got punished today, first by the league, then even more harshly by the team itself. Kim Brunhuber tells us what the Houston Astros did and how they did it. With Evan Janice, Have a look at this, the Houston Astros against the Chicago White Sox. And listen closely, listen for an unusual banging sound right before this pitch. There, those two loud bangs. That's the sound of an Astros player banging a garbage can. That was the signal in an elaborate scheme to steal signs from the opposing catcher to the pitcher. Popped up. In November, a former Astros pitcher revealed that team personnel used a center field camera to decode signs, and then players would signal to the hitter which pitch was coming. Today, a league investigation confirmed the allegations, and the Astros were fined a record $5 million. Uh, listen, it's, it's, it's the stiffest penalty that, that uh, any team has ever taken or, or given, and we accept that. The league also suspended the Houston Astros general manager and manager for an entire year. Then, hours later, the team's owner said he felt he had to go a step further and fired them both. Neither one of them started this, but neither one of them did anything about it. The Astros used the system the year they won the World Series, but Crane insists the team being caught for cheating doesn't taint their title. The Houston Astros are world champions! Baseball has a long history of sign stealing, but using electronics is against the rules, and in recent years the league has been cracking down. This ruling is a reminder to players and managers to steal signs legally, the old-fashioned way, with their eyes. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. Next on The National, insert your high-flying political pun of choice right here. He shared that it was actually on his bucket list. Former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien goes airborne for his 86th birthday. The details next. It was former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien's 86th birthday this weekend, and he celebrated it flying high. Along with his family, the former Prime Minister checked off an item on his bucket list, and his moment is ours too. It was a family member that called uh, several weeks back. They were looking to organize uh, his birthday. Once we do bookings, we asked for names of people, so we found out that um, he was part of it. There were four generations of people flying, which is really, really cool. Pretty amazing to see a five-year-old fly and then an 86-year-old fly um, in the same sessions. We had to take extra precautions to make sure that uh, everything was going to go fine. Uh, but he managed to fly and he was great. He's humble about everything and he had a lot of anecdotes to share. He shared with us that George Bush's uh, father had done a, a skydiving jump um, a few years back. So he sort of wanted to do that as well. But uh, indoor skydiving had been on his bucket list for he was a bit of a kid again, you know, doing this uh, this kind of superhero things. <laughs> I could see how that would be pretty fun. I, I, I've never done that before. Is that something that you would 
Oh, venture inside? Into? I would totally, I don't know about my 86th birthday. I mean, <laughs> you did me. sooner I'll than that. You know. yeah, sure. uh, I, I would definitely do that. I, I, I wouldn't do the real skydiving, no bungee jumping, no roller coasters. I'm a bit of a chicken in some parts of my Get life, out. but you, that I would do. You a chicken? Yeah, you, 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 uh, You've dodged bullets, explosions, I mean. Well, on my weekends, I'm not going to do that. So. <laughs> Recreationally, yeah, it's off exactly. limits, right? Yeah, I don't know. It seems like uh, it'd be kind of fun. I think I would, uh, one weekend. This weekend, we'll go. We'll make a point of it. That's The National for this Monday, January 13th. Have a good night. Good night.